as announced before the z transform is a linear transform this linearity property is inherited from the laplace transform given the z transform of the sequence f of k and the z transform of the sequence g of k you can obtain the z transform of a linear combination of these sequences and this z transform is simply obtained by taking the same linear combination of the z transform of f of k and the z transform of g of k the region of convergence of this linear of the z transform of this linear combination is simply the intersection of the regions of convergence of the z transforms of the sequences f and g we know from the time shifting property that with zero initial conditions the z transform of a signal f of k that has been shifted to the right by k0 can be obtained from the original z transform of the unshifted signal multiplied by z minus k0 so assume now that we have a system that has transfer function z minus 1 we have not yet introduced the transfer function in the context of discrete time systems but you can imagine from what you have seen in the Laplace domain that the transfer function will link the input x of z to the output as follows. We'll come back to that later. So if a system is described by a transfer function z minus 1, then you have this relation over here. And from what you see over here, if you do the inverse z transform you see that all well, the output and the input are linked as described over here so you can see here that the output is simply the input shifted by one this is why the operator z minus one is called the unit delay operator this should not come as a surprise. So if we go back to the Laplace domain and that we have that the Laplace transform of f of t is f of s, then we know that the Laplace transform of a time shifted signal is, well, it's f of s times exponential of minus theta s f of s. Let us now assume that we sample the signal with a period Ts and that theta is k0 times Ts, right? Well, then we can have a look at this quantity over here. It's e to the minus k0 Ts s. Right. Remember also that z is defined as an exponential of t s s. Okay. This is the link between the s plane and the z domain. So you can see that this quantity over here is simply z minus k zero, and this again shows that z minus one is the unit delay operator. The next property of the z transform involves the derivative of f of z. Remember that f of z is the z transform of the sequence f of k. We assume again a one-sided z transform. So we have f of k z minus k, right? So if we take the derivative of this quantity with respect to z this is what you obtain and this here if you compute it it's minus k z to the minus k minus 1 
okay so you can rewrite this and this is what we obtain and why do we rewrite this well because you see here that this is a z transform it's the z transform of k f k u of k right so if you want to obtain this z transform well you can obtain it from the derivative of f of z and you have to well you have to take this one and take it on the other side so you have to multiply this derivative of f of z by minus z so from this property of the derivative of f of z we can compute the z transform of k f of k uk knowing the z transform of the sequence fk uk so what we can do is use this property to obtain this z transform over here so you can see here that f of k is alpha k so this means that we need the z transform of f of k uk so alpha k u k and we have shown previously that this is 1 over 1 minus alpha z minus 1 or equivalently if you use the variable z z over z minus alpha and the region of convergence was that the modulus of z is larger than alpha right so we can use this property over here to obtain this z transform so it's minus z times the derivative of and this is f of z over here it's minus z times the derivative of this one with respect to z this is the z transform of this one when you use the variable z minus one but it's of course easier to work with the variable z so this is f of z over here and if we compute the derivative of f of z with respect to z what we have is z minus alpha squared at the numerator z minus alpha times the derivative of the numerator it's 1 minus z times the derivative of the denominator and it's a 1 also so the derivative is minus alpha z minus alpha squared right so if you multiply this derivative now by minus z this is what you obtain and the region of convergence will also be that the modulus of z is larger than alpha you have to look at the pole and you construct a circle of radius alpha we assume here that alpha is real but it would work also with complex alpha but then you would have to take the modulus and you construct a circle on this modulus of alpha and the region of convergence is of course what is outside of the circle so what you have right now is all the z transform that you can obtain in an exercise so the z transform of the unit impulse delta k so this is one and the region of convergence is the z plane we have the z transform of the unit step this is z over z minus one and the region of convergence is z in modulus larger than one we have the z transform of the exponential signal this is z over z minus alpha and the region of convergence is z larger than alpha we assume here that alpha is 
real and the one that we have here below is the z transform of k alpha k uk and this is alpha z z minus alpha squared and the region of convergence is z larger than alpha in the laplace domain a convolution becomes a simple product after the laplace transform you will have something very similar for the z transform as you can see the z transform of the convolution of two signals fk and gk is simply the product of the z transforms of the underlying signals we have seen in the previous subsection that if you know the impulse response h of k and the signal x of k well you can compute the response by taking the convolution it will be the convolution sum and this will be y of k we see also here that the z transform of this convolution is of course h of z x of z and this is because of this property that we've just described so an easier way very often to obtain the response of the signal is to compute the z transform of h of k this is the as we will see later the transfer function the compute also the z transform of the input signal right convolution then becomes simply a product in the z domain and then obtain the output by simply taking the inverse z transform well we can represent this visually so remember that if we are given the impulse response of the system and the input signal we can obtain the output signal by remaining in the discrete time domain and computing this convolution sum and remember that if the impulse response and the input signal are both causal you can replace the bounds by zero and k so this is one approach it's not always the simplest approach just as in the case of the laplace domain it is often simpler to compute the z transform so the idea is that you compute the z transform and you obtain the transfer function and the z transform of the input convolution is now simply a product okay so it's very easy to do and to obtain y of k what you need to do is do the inverse z transform well we can again define a concept of a transfer function of a discrete time system this transfer function is the z transform of the impulse response of the underlying linear time invariant system and it can be defined as the ratio of the z transform of the output so y of z over the z transform of the input x of z so the transfer function h of z is the relation between the input and the output when there are no initial condition the transfer function characterizes the system by its poles and its zeros okay so by looking at the poles mostly you can kind of have the signature of the system and it is a very important tool for analysis and design of systems and more in particular to design control systems as you will see in this course of digital control it is now time to discuss stability in the z domain and this stability will of course involve the stability condition 
in the discrete time domain and well, it will link it with the transfer function. This is why we need the region of convergence of the Z transform of the impulse response. So it is the region of convergence of H of Z, right? And remember that this is the set of all Z's that can be written as a complex number under polar form such that this sum here is bounded such that this sequence is absolutely summable this is another way to see this so this is the region of convergence of the transfer function and in the time domain a causal LTI system, linear time invariance system, is bounded input, bounded output stable, if and only if its impulse response is absolutely summable. So what you observe is that if the region of convergence of the transfer function contains R is equal to 1, so that's the unit circle, then of course this sum is bounded and therefore the system is bounded input bounded output stable going in the other direction if the system is bounded input bounded output stable then this sum converges and you can immediately see that r is equal to one which is the unit circle must automatically be in the region of convergence this tells you that a discrete causal linear time invariance system is stable if it can be described by a transfer function h of z that has a region of convergence that includes the unit circle. And we will see in the next slide that for a causal system this condition is equivalent of requesting that all the poles of the transfer function are located strictly inside the unit circle this is not a surprise we had kind of see this seen this already in a few examples so in order to obtain the region of convergence remember that you take the pole with the largest radius and here it's clearly this pole over here and here it's this pole over here you construct a circle with this same radius and the region of convergence is the outside of this circle of radius the largest radius that you can find among all the poles of the transfer function h of z we've seen in the previous slide that well the system is stable if the region of convergence contains the unit circle so this is clearly the case over here so this system with these poles here will be stable this is not the case over here because you can clearly see that the unit circle is not in the region of convergence so this describes here an unstable system you can see what happens if you take this pole and you drag it along the real axis at some stage when you pass the unit circle well the region of convergence will not contain the unit circle anymore and the system will become unstable so you can kind of see here that indeed in the z domain you can kind of determine the stability of a system by looking at the poles and if all the poles are inside the unit circle the system is indeed stable so we still have to treat the case where we have poles on the unit circle so this case is clear if all poles are strictly inside the unit circle the system is stable if we have poles outside the unit circle the system is unstable so now assume that we have a transfer function h of z that has poles inside the unit circle and one real pole 
on the unit circle or simple complex conjugal poles on the unit circle well this system is called marginally stable it's at the limit of stability let us take an example assume that h of z is z over z minus one so you clearly have here a pole on the unit circle right it's situated over here well then you know that h of k the impulse response will be z minus one of h of z and you see that this is u of k this is a system that is at the limit of stability okay its impulse response is neither diverging or converging to zero so it's at the limit of stability now if you have several poles on the unit circle then the system is unstable it can be several real poles or well several complex conjugate poles so let us take an example the system with transfer function z over z minus one squared okay so it will have a pole over here but it has also a second one at the same spot right I cannot draw it but I have to show that there are two it's it's visible from the square over here so the impulse response of that system will be z minus 1 of h of z and we have seen that this is k u of k so the impulse response is a ramp okay and this is clearly a diverging signal okay so clearly the sum of the absolute value of h of k is diverging okay so when you look at this sequence it's not absolutely summable so this system is diverging so what we do here is look at the dynamical behavior of systems with a impulse response that is a discrete real exponential so alpha is real over here and we look at the corresponding pole location of the transfer function so we have to compute the z transform of the impulse response and this discrete real exponential but this is something that we have done before so you have z over z minus alpha so you have a pole in alpha and a zero at zero the zero is indicated by the circle and the pole is indicated by this cross well we will not focus on the position of the zeros in this course so let us focus on the position of the real pole at z is equal to alpha and here we have a case where alpha is one so the pole is located on the unit circle so you have kind of a case that is a limiting case and indeed you see that the impulse response is not asymptotically stable but it's not diverging so what we can do is increase alpha if we increase it to 1.2 well the pole is outside the unit circle so obviously as you can see because of this value of 1.2 the impulse response is now diverging if you take an alpha 0.8 clearly the pole is inside the unit circle so the corresponding impulse response will be converging to zero we had seen previously that if you take alpha negative well the pole is at minus 0.8 so clearly but the underlying system is stable and this is what you see here in the impulse response it converges to zero but you have this alternation of signs huh? because you take successive powers of minus 0.8 the even powers will be positive and the odd powers will be negative if you go to alpha is equal to minus one we arrive here again at a pole on the unit circle so we're at the limit of stability this is not 
a syntactically stable behavior, but it's not unstable as well. Okay, so you can see this as a limiting case. And of course, if alpha is minus 1.2, the pole is outside the unit circle. And clearly, you can see that the system is unstable because alpha is negative. You see again this alternation in of signs in the impulse response. What we'll do right now is look at the systems that have this type of impulse response and make the links with the poles of the transfer function. So what we need to do is compute the transfer function. So the Z transform of this signal, what you can see here is that you have a cosine. So using the Euler identity, well, you can construct this cosine using an exponential or a phaser rotating counterclockwise and another one that is rotating clockwise. This you can rewrite as R0 exponential of J omega 0 K times exponential of J phi. And here you'll have something similar, but with the complex conjugate of this one, it will be R0 exponential of minus j omega 0 to the power k exponential of minus j phi, right? So this signal can be written as a half times a alpha k plus a alpha k conjugate right and here a will be exponential of j phi and alpha will be exponential of j omega zero and i forgot the r is zero over here so the z transform of this type of signal z transform of alpha k uk is equal to z over z minus alpha with z larger than alpha in modulus. Okay, so if you take this signal over here, okay, or this signal, and you take the z transform, this is what you're going to obtain, right? And if you do the calculations, this is what you obtain, but this is not so very important. The important thing is that you see that the poles of the z transform that are associated to this well impulse response are in r0 exponential of plus minus j omega zero so you have to make the link between well the argument here and the frequency over here and the radius that you've got over here and this well damping function that you have here in the impulse response of course it's also possible to compute the zeros but this goes beyond the scope of the course so in the next slides what we'll do is look at this type of impulse response as a function of the poles of the transfer function. So let us take an example here and the poles are located here at a distance 0.8 of the origin. Of course you have the other one, the complex conjugate and the angle here, the discrete frequency is pi over 4. Okay, so these pole locations leads to an impulse response that is like this here it's a cosine the fact that it's a cosine is linked to the zeros okay this is not so very important a cosine or a sine is just a shift phase shift okay so this will have an influence on the zeros but the behavior will be the same so p over 4 is pi over 4 is related to the frequency and this r0 yeah, that is 0.8 well is 
kind of related to the fact that this is indeed a stable signal and well that this will be something that will be converging to zero as k is increasing this is the same signal same pulse but it's a sign and you see that the poles are the same it's just a question of changing the zeros and this is this has an influence on the phase shift but again this point 8 is making sure that the signal is converging to zero so here we have come back to this cosine example the radius R0 has remained the same but the discrete frequency has now changed to 3 pi over 4 and you see this that you have a well, higher frequency in the signal. In this example the radius is 1.2 and the angle is pi over 4 and here we have taken the cosine example this is indicated by the zero but as I've said this is not so important you can see that the poles here are outside the unit circle so of course the impulse response will diverge okay but you can see that from a frequency point of view we still have the same discrete frequency pi over 4 and this R0 of 1.2 is going to make this impulse response diverge. Well, this is an example where the pole location will be such that R0 is fixed to 0.8. So the poles will be moving on a circle of a radius 0.8. We'll start with a frequency, a discrete frequency, omega 0 of pi over 12, and then increase. And you will see this in the impulse response given in blue. So, pi over 12, pi over 6 here, pi over 4, you can see that the frequency is indeed increasing, pi over 3, and pi over 2. In this example, the discrete frequency will remain at pi over 4 but the radius r0 which is now 0.9 is going to increase so this is going to dampen the impulse response because you're getting closer and closer to the origin and this r0 that is taken to the power k well is going faster to 0 0.8 0.7 0.6 0 5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, and 0.1. Well, this slide gives you an overview of the types of impulse responses that you can have as a function of the poles of the transfer function. We will see that there is also an initial and a final value theorem in the Z domain. And what I will show you now is not a proof, but it's a useful mnemonic to kind of find this initial and value theorems in the Z domain. So we start with the initial and final value theorems in the Laplace domain. So we know that the limit when t is going to infinity of y of t is equal to the limit when s is going to 0 and when t is going to infinity s is going to 0 there is this 1 over x relation between time and frequency of s y of s and remember that there are hypotheses right this is the final value theorem and you also have this initial value theorem that says that the limit when t tends to zero of y of t is the limit when s tends to infinity of s y of s so remember now that the laplace transform of a unit step is 1 over s 
and that's the z transform of a unit step is z over z minus one right and that the link between the z domain and the s domain is z is equal to i'm going to erase that because there's no need to put a plus or a minus so it's the exponential of ts s right so this is laplace domain and here we'll do the z domain so the limit will be when k tends to infinity of the sequence y of k when s is going to zero you can see over here that z is going to tend to one and s well we can see that and this is how you see that it's not a proof one over s corresponds to z over z minus one so this is s will correspond to z minus 1 over z y of z okay and this is equivalent to the limit when z is tending to 1 of z minus 1 y z and this is the well final value theorem in the z domain and equivalently well, you can find that the limit when k tends to 0 of y of k is a limit when s tends to infinity over here well so does z so it's a limit from when z tends to infinity of z minus 1 z y of z but when z tends to infinity well z minus 1 over z tends to 1 so it's the limit when z tends to infinity of y of z and this is the initial value theorem in the z domain so you see here that these are indeed the equations that we have derived previously and remember that this initial and final value theorem is used when you want to have well, an idea of y of k given y of z and you do not want to compute the inverse z transform of y z so you want or you can kind of obtain information of y of k in the vicinity of k is equal to zero this is the initial value theorem and when k tends to infinity this is the final value theorem so when you compute the initial value well we have to make the assumption of course that the limit exists right and for the final value theorem we have to make sure that the well test that the poles of z minus 1 y z are all inside the unit circle before we use this final value theorem if this is not the case we could draw well the wrong conclusions using this final value theorem and we had found something similar for the final value theorem in the Laplace domain. The static gain of a system described by a transfer function h of z is, well, the transfer function evaluated at z is equal to one. Okay, so this is the static gain and the static gain, well, we've seen this before, tells you the ratio of output and input under steady state conditions so if the input x of k is a constant x zero and the system is stable then the output will reach the steady state output value static gain times x zero once all the transients have disappeared well this can be shown 
quite easily using the final value theorem. So let us assume that we have at the input of the system an input x0 u of k. So it's a step of input x0. Then x of z, if you take the z transform, will be x0 z over z minus 1. These are things that we have seen before and that by now should look familiar. So y of z will be h of z times x of z. So if we're interested at what happens in steady state, we have to use the final value theorem. So it's the limit when k tends to infinity of y of k. Okay, so this is going to be my y0 over here. And it's the limit when z tends to 1 of z minus 1 times h of, sorry, times yz, right? And this will be the limit when z tends to 1 of z minus 1. And then we'll have h of z, right? And we'll have x0, z, z minus 1. So this is x of z over here, right? So this will cancel out. And this will be, well, I'll write it over here, the limit when z tends to 1 of h of z times x0 z so it will be h of 1 times x0 okay so we have that y0 is h of 1 uh, h of z evaluated at z equals 1 times x0 so this is indeed the static gain Remember that in the Laplace domain, the static gain was h of s evaluated at s is equal to 0. And remember that z is linked to s by the exponential of t s s. So if you plug in s is equal to 0, we obtain indeed z is equal to 1. So it makes sense that in the z domain, the static gain is obtained by considering the transfer function at z is equal to 1. Let us now illustrate these initial and final value theorems in the z domain. So assume that we are given a system that is described by an impulse response alpha to the power k u k alpha is real and we'll assume that the modulus of alpha is smaller than one so that we have here a stable system and that we are able to use the final value theorem okay so we'll Consider the step response of the system that is described by this impulse response. So the input will be a step, right? So what we could do is compute y of k by considering the convolution sum hk xk. Okay, so this is going to be quite a computation. So what we could do is go to the z domain and obtain the transfer function of the system. And this will be z over z minus alpha. So please check this, because by now this should look familiar. z is larger than alpha. And x of z is z over z minus 1. And here the modulus is larger than 1. 
So these are the regions of convergence of the associated Z transform. So Y of Z is simple to compute in the Z domain. It's well it's simply the product of those two. So it's Z square divided by Z minus alpha Z minus one. So what you could do is take the inverse Z transform and obtain YK, but let's assume that we're a bit lazy and that we are interested in Y0 and the limit when K tends to infinity of Y of K. Well, then we can use the initial value theorem And y0 is equal to this limit over here. And if you look at this, yz, the power, the highest power to numerator is z square, and it's also z square at the denominator. So this limit is 1. So let us use the final value theorem. So the limit is from z tending to 1 of z minus 1 yz so this is z square z minus alpha z minus 1 okay remember this is yz and this limit is 1 over 1 minus alpha so using this initial and value theorem we can have an idea of the step response at the initial time k is equal to zero and at the final time when k tends to infinity we can test this very quickly into MATLAB so alpha will say that it is 0.5 then we can kind of introduce the numerator polynomial it's z the denominator polynomial it's z minus alpha so it's one and then minus alpha and then we can use the and because we are computing the step response the d step response it's the discrete step response num then and this is what we have here okay so we see here indeed that in zero the response is one and it tends to two so this is indeed equal to one over one minus alpha so one over a half which is two we have seen that the response of a discrete time system can be obtained described by a difference equation if the system is lti well we'll have a linear difference equation with real coefficients such as here shown on the screen well to solve this difference equation we'll have to go to the z domain and of course this will involve initial conditions y of minus k for k going from 1 to n right after z transform you obtain this relation and this relation looks a lot like the relation that we had obtained for linear time invariant but continuous time systems that were described by differential equations and you had exactly the same equation but with z replaced by s so here y of z is the z transform of the output x of z is the z transform of the input i of z well depends on the initial conditions and the polynomials a and b are given over here it's quite easy to obtain this because if you take the z transform of this you have z minus m y of z and then you'll have the influence of the initial conditions okay so this is how you obtain for instance the polynomial a of z 
So once you have the response in the Z domain, well, you can obtain the complete response in the discrete time domain. This is just evolving a inverse Z transform. And we have just seen how you can do this. And of course, this will involve partial fraction expansions. You see here that this complete response is the sum of two terms. The first one is the zero state input. It's the response where the initial conditions are zero. It's the response that comes solely from the input. Okay, so in French it's called la réponse forcée. The second term is the zero input response. This is the response when the res input is zero and it's the response that is coming purely from the initial conditions in French la réponse libre. And you know that the relation between y and x when the initial conditions is zero is the transfer function. So this is the transfer function. And as you know, the transfer function here is the Z transform of the impulse response. We've seen in last year's course of signals and systems that there is a tight link between the transfer function and the frequency response of the system. And this will also be the case for discrete time systems. So remember that this steady state response is the response to a sinusoidal input signal and it's the response in steady state starting from a system at rest. So the input is a sine, right? Here omega is the discrete frequency. Remember that it's linked to the or continuous time frequency by this relation over here. This sign can be rewritten in terms of exponentials, right? Complex exponentials, that's the Euler identity. So what we'll do in order to obtain the response of this one, we'll consider the response of this complex exponential. And then by linearity, we'll be able to reconstruct the response to a sinusoidal input signal. You kind of expect the output to be a sinusoidal signal at the same frequency, but attenuated and well delayed, so phase shifted. And this will lead, of course, to the concept of a body diagram. So we are looking for the response of the system to this input signal over here. So what we'll do is take its Z transform. And here it is. If this comes as a surprise, you should go back in this course or go and have a look in the video course signals and systems. We'll assume that the system is stable and at rest. And you see that the response, of course, is given by this relation. This is just convolution in the Z domain. Right, so we are interested in y of z, so we have to kind of do the inverse z transform, and for that, we'll have to do a partial fraction expansion. And we'll use one of these methods that we've seen last year, which consists in taking the partial fraction expansion of y of z over z. Why do we do this? But this is because when we are finished, we can simply multiply by z and we'll have something here, z over z minus p1, which is a known z transform. Okay, so what we do over here is that we assume that the poles are real. A similar uh, argument can be held when the poles are a complex conjugates, but for ease of uh, the argument we simply stick to real poles since the system is stable all those poles p1 to pn are inside the unit circle so we can compute the c1 to cn and c over here you will see that c1 and cn will not play a very important role so i'll stick to this c here well how do we obtain this c well it's the limit when z tends to the exponential of j omega here of yz over z so this is 
hz over z minus the exponential g omega times this one so these two will cancel out and of course c will be equal to h evaluated in the exponential of j omega so c here can be obtained quite easily so if we multiply we have by z we have y of z and what we can then do is do the inverse z transform and we end up with this time domain response remember that we have assumed a system that is stable okay so the poles p1 to pn are inside the unit circle and here to make things easy we have considered them a real so you can see that when k okay will tend to infinity this term will disappear okay and this is precisely the steady state response okay so the natural modes of the system these ones here p1k to pnk will disappear from the steady state response and we are left with the steady state response well which is also a complex exponential but multiplied by c which is given over here okay this is really also a complex number so this is the summary the steady state time domain response is given over here remember that the input was xk is simply this complex exponential u of k the natural modes disappear so you end up with this here and c is given by this complex number it's simply the transfer function evaluated as z is equal to the exponential of j omega this is the result of the previous slide so this is the input that we are considering right and in steady state this is what you obtain this is c that we had computed previously so what you can do as this is really a complex number you can write it in polar form okay so this is equal to well the modulus times the exponential of j times the argument of h of exponential of j omega right so if you multiply and you use the properties of the exponential this is how you can rewrite this of course we are not interested in the response to this complex exponential but we are interested in the response to this sinusoidal input signal remember that we've shown it in the beginning of this subsection you can rewrite this using Euler's identity as well the complex exponential that we've considered above minus well this is complex exponential but with a minus sign u of k the response to this one you've got it over here and the response to this one over here well we can obtain it very easily if you go through the arguments well you have here a minus sign over here you'll have a minus sign over here and you'll have a minus sign over here what we can then do by linearity is superposition we can obtain the response to this input sign and well you'll have to go through the calculations and also remember that the magnitude spectrum is even so h of exponential j omega in modulus is equal to this same modulus but with a minus sign in the exponential okay so this is simply saying that the amplitude spectrum is even we have seen this in last year's course of signals and systems and the phase spectrum is uneven so we'll have that the argument of h evaluated at the exponential is equal to minus the argument 
same expression but with a minus sign in the exponential if you use that if you use the response of this one minus the response of this one over 1 of 2j you use those two relations you'll end up with the steady state response to this sinusoidal input signal and the results will look a lot like what you've over uh, what you've got over here and it does not come as a surprise the steady state response is a sinusoid at the same frequency but it is amplified attenuated by the modulus of h evaluated at the exponent of j omega so this attenuation amplification is frequency dependent and there is a shift okay so there is a phase shift which is really the argument of h applied uh, when z is exponential of g omega so this phase shift is frequency dependent as well remember that this discrete frequency can be rewritten like this omega is expressed in radians per second so this is seconds right so this is simply radians omega is in the range minus pi pi okay but since the spectra are amplitude spectrum is even phase spectrum is uneven what we'll do is consider it in not this um, range but we'll replace this by zero over here okay zero to pi so which means that the frequency omega expressed here in radians per second will lie because this is the one we consider right in the range 0 to pi over ts and this is of course the Nyquist frequency well here is the summary of all this so we can compute the steady state response and this is very important so this means that all transients have disappeared to the sinusoidal input that is given over here and it is as follows so what you see and this is really important the system is linear so you'll have a sinusoid at the same frequency it will be attenuated or amplified by a quantity that is frequency dependent and well this quantity is the magnitude or modulus of h of z evaluated at z is equal to the exponential of j omega the input signal will also be delayed so there is a phase shift which is also a function of omega right and this phase shift well it's the argument of h of z evaluated at z is equal to exponential of j omega so omega here is the discrete frequency it's well since we see that we know that the amplitude spectrum and the phase spectrum are respectively even and uneven well we'll consider it in the interval 0 to 2 pi but what is really interesting for us is this frequency expressed in radians per second that will evolve in the interval 0 to pi over ts so 0 to the nyquist frequency well this linear in this case discrete time system acts as a frequency filter okay where the frequency varies from 0 here to the nyquist frequency we have seen something very similar in the course fundamentals of control theory of my colleague david rouchard but in continuous time where the frequency ranges from zero to infinity and as if you you have seen in this same course well this steady state response to well sinusoidal inputs can be represented graphically in a Bode diagram Nyquist diagram and Black-Nichols diagram so if you want to have the details 
go and have a look in this course and in this course of digital control we'll mainly focus on the Bode diagram and on the Nyquist diagram well in the Bode diagram you have the top part and the bottom part in the top part well, you represent the modulus as a function of the frequency we like to do this in as a function of the frequency expressed in a radians per second okay so in this top part of the body diagram you see the amplification or attenuation as a function of the frequency in the bottom part you see the phase shift represented as a function of frequency usually we use logarithmic or semi logarithmic scales this has the advantage that if you're kind of looking for the Bode diagram of H1Z H2Z you can simply have or look at the Bode diagram of H1Z that of H2Z and then simply add this is something of course that you've seen in the course of fundamentals of control theory but you can still do the same use the same trick in this course for discrete time systems well in the nyquist diagram you work in a cartesian frame and you represent the real part against the imaginary part using frequency as a parameter in the plot another way to see this is that at each frequency you obtain a point in this cartesian frame but this point can also be viewed as a phaser okay so there you have module information and phase information okay so this is also something that you have covered in the course of fundamentals of control theory and that is still valid here for discrete time systems there is however a major difference between continuous time and discrete time you've seen in last year's course of fundamentals of control theory that you could obtain approximations of the actual body diagram using so-called straight line asymptotic approximations right and you could do this because in the transfer function you had a rational dependency in j omega but if you go to the discrete time case well this rational dependency in j omega is replaced by a rational dependency in the exponential of j omega ts so everything becomes really non-linear in this uh, well, frequency omega so asymptotic approximations are no longer possible there are some changes of variables that you could do to recover this rational dependency and this is what is what was used in the old days but it's kind of complicated so my advice to you would be well really to use the computer to draw body diagrams in the discrete time case so here's an example of a frequency response of a very simple process okay that is given over here what you do is consider the transfer function in the exponential of j omega and here omega is this capital omega so the discrete frequency of course it's related to the frequency expressed in radians per second by this expression so to obtain the modulus it's very simple you multiply this one by its complex conjugate you take the square root and this is what you obtain right and to obtain the argument well you have to kind of rewrite this in terms of a real part an, uh, an imaginary part sorry and then take the arc tangent of the imaginary part over the real part and this is what you obtain so what you can now do is 
in the Bode diagram represent this as a function of omega, the discrete frequency, and do the same for the phase shift. But what is usually done, of course, is to represent it as a function of the well frequency expressed in radians per second. So here is the system that we have used. We assume that Ts is 0.1 seconds. What you can then do is define the discrete frequency ranging from 0 to pi, right? The frequency expressed in radians per second is easily obtained. You just divide by Ts and then you can have a look at the magnitude and phase. This is really the two formula that we have obtained in the previous slide. So what you can do then is represent this magnitude and phase. We bring it back to degrees over here, right? And represent it as a function of omega. This is this omega here expressed in radians per second and you obtain the Bode diagram. Of course, in MATLAB, it's much easier to use the command D Bode, but this is just simply showing you how to obtain this and to show you also what is behind this function d boat. So this is what you obtain with both weight, ways to go, the d boat command with MATLAB and well really computing and representing the Bode diagram yourself as we have shown in the code. You can see here the amplification attenuation of the system as a function of frequency and here you see the associated phase shift of course in discrete time well you can only see the frequency response up to the nyquist frequency and here we had a nyquist frequency which is pi over ts right and ts is 0.1 so indeed this is approximately 31 radians per second here we're illustrating what you can do with MATLAB a system with transfer function z plus 1 this is what you can see here and at the denominator z minus 0.5 z minus 0.7 is considered and the sampling period is 0.1 of a second so then the impulse response is computed the step response and then the input to a sign so the response when the input is assigned and well finally the border diagram is computed so this is the impulse response the step response the response to a sinusoidal input you notice that the input has amplitude one and this is the response here we have the body plots and in orange the input or the the frequency of the input sign from the previous slide is indicated so you can see that you should have at the output a amplification of roughly well 23 24 db something like that and a phase shift of minus 20 degrees and you see that more than 20 dbs corresponds to an amplification of more than 10 and this is indeed the case and you can see this small phase shift of 20 degrees it is also possible to compute Nyquist plots. Well, of course, you can also work with Python here again in this Jupyter Lab environment of the Anaconda environment. So here you have a first example where the control package is used. So you can see that the same example is used as previously and it's possible to compute the impulse response the step response, the response to a sign and to compute the body diagram. It is also possible to work with an other package and this is what sometimes makes it a bit more difficult in Python. 
you have different packages you can work with this is with the scipy signal package so the system is introduced like this and again you can in compute the impulse step response the response to an input signal which is a sign over here and compute the body diagram